Hello everyone, this is Janelle Baez with OVM TV at Jungle Island, Miami, Florida. In appreciation for Parent Foster Day, this is a great event for all the families that have fostered children throughout South Florida. And now we're gonna do a little bit of interviewing to see how these families feel with their new foster children. We are here with Jennifer Philly. She is a foster parent for uh, children from his house. She's been fostering children since 2019. How are you, Jennifer? I'm doing great. Nice talking to you guys. Nice to have you here. Tell me a little bit about your trajectory with um, fostering these children. How did it start? What is it that got you involved with it? And how has been the process so far? Yes, I heard about foster care by my family and brother-in-law. They were fostering. And we got exposed to the need that is here, especially in South Florida. The statistics of children in care are very high. So we decided to open our home and say yes. It has not been easy, but it's been so worth it. Loving children from hard places takes a lot of patience, um, training, trauma-informed training for sure. But all they need is love. So we are willing to to love them as long as we have them. And we fight for reunification as well. We, we hope and we pray for families to be reunified. Even when that is not possible, now our heart is also for adoption, for them to finally have a forever home. Yes, and how does God play an important role in this whole entire trajectory through this situation? I think it's fundamental and it's, it's essential because that's the heart of the father towards us, that he loves us as his child. Even he adopted us. And because of the, the power that he instilled in us as with the Holy Spirit, we can then love them um, as he loves us with un unconditional love because it will not be easy and with, um, with commitment through the ups and downs. And that's how he loves us and that's how we can love them as well. I completely agree, Jennifer. What do you say is the hardest thing about being a foster parent? I would say the hardest thing is the goodbyes, um, especially if you don't know if they are going to be safe. But we know that the children are his. They are God's. And if we put them in his hands, no matter where they go, he will always be with them. And that's our hope. That's Kyle Peterson, he is another parent that is fostering several children. How are you, Kyle? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Tell me a little bit how you got introduced to fostering children and how has this process been for you so far? What has been the most enjoyable part of this? Well, um, my wife, who uh, is the biggest uh, supporter of our uh, adventures with foster, um, has always had a dream goal of to foster children. And uh, we talked about it and we decided it was right for our family uh, to help children that needed some love and support and some care. And so we got involved into the foster system through uh, his house uh, by doing that. Um, it's been very rewarding to see the different kids come and grow. Um, they get some love. They get some care. We've had some for a long time. We've had some for a short time. Uh, but they've made a mark on each of our kids and our lives as well. And uh, I think it's been a positive experience all around. Great. And how many children have you fostered between you and your family, your, your wife? Uh, let's see. So we've had two very long-term ones, and then we've had probably about five or six shorter-term ones. So I guess about seven or eight. Okay. Do you pray with your children, and um, what kind of influences of God and Jesus Christ do you instill in them to let them know that they are with them, and um, how has that been a part of this story as well? So we've mostly had babies. <laughs> They've all been about under one. Uh, I think the one we have now is a little older one, but we've had her for a long time. Um, but we've taken them to church with us, and we've uh, taken them to our kids' church events at school and things like that. So they've been exposed a lot, and uh, they're just a blessing to have. Oh, and for the last question, what do you say is the most enjoyable part of it, and what has been the most difficult part of it? So the most enjoyable part about it is is just the children. Uh, they are a dream to have in our home. Uh, we already have kids in our home, but we also now get to have more kids in our home. And I think it's been a very positive light on our, our own kids to see uh, the difference it can make. And I've seen the difference it makes in our kids uh, by having them in our home as well. Um, some difficult things is just kind of dealing with the system and the way that things operate or work, but once you kind of get the idea of how things work, it's it's not a problem at all. We're here with Agnes St. Prue and Christine Bennett. Um, 
she is a foster child and she is a foster parent from his house. We're going to speak a little bit with them and they're going to tell us about their experience. How are you ladies today? Doing great yourself. I'm doing very well. Thank you. So from my understanding, you, you fostered Agnes. At what age did that start? Tell us a little bit about the trajectory and how did you hear about his house or how did the whole initiation process begin? Well, as for me, um, I just always knew that I wanted to foster, uh, the Lord put it on my heart to foster. And I have two kids and I was a single parent of my own. So I said, the best way that I could do is to help a, a young mom that have a baby. I'll get a baby in the house and I'll be able to help a mom be led. And so that's what I said. And most people are not asking for teenagers with babies at all. That they stay in foster homes and they actually age out. So I had my pick of any of the kids because they had many of them in foster care. So I would get one. I got one before I got Agnes. And then um, she went back to her mom because her mom moved to a place where they had someone. But Agnes um, didn't have any parents. Her Both of her parents had passed away from HIV AIDS. So her, she was in foster care and they had split up her and her sisters and her brother. They were in a foster care in, a, in different homes. And so that's how I met Agnes. She came with the baby and, and that's where we went. And so when you met her, how was that experience for you? How did you feel? And what were some of the things that were going through your mind? Because you were already a teenager. So, you know, you don't have the psychology of that of a three-year-old or a five-year-old. You have your own thoughts, your own beliefs, and I'm sure you were set in your own ways. How was that experience for you? Um, that experience for me was a little challenging. Um, just being, just coming from being on my own for such a long time and then going back into structure, I was like, no, I can do whatever I want. I have my own kid, I have my own child, and um, I'm an adult. And that's how I um, went through about my life. And then I realized it wasn't such a, a positive mindset to have. And um, how I got into um, his house was after leaving her home, um, I was trying to be an adult, not doing what I was supposed to do, and then, um, my son, um, I wasn't supposed to see my son's father because we had an adjust domestic violence relationship, and um, my caseworkers found out. Um, they separated me and my son for six months, and I had to do everything I had to get him back into my care. And um, once I did all of my domestic violence classes, my parenting classes, and started going back to school, that's when I his house was the second home that was able to take me in with my son. So that's how I encountered um, his house. And that was my last placement until I aged out of foster care. Do you, well, when you were originally fostered, did you come from a spiritual background or a foundation of Christianity or some kind of religion? Because, I mean, now that we are women in faith, we know that when somebody comes into our life, you know, that's kind of like, okay, this person was sent by the Lord. They're here to help. Let me try to comply as best as I can. You know, it's kind of like you see the signs, right? Did you see those signs? Did you kind of like take that into account and say, okay, you know what, maybe I should be following this woman. She has some kind of wisdom or some kind of higher knowledge. Let me try to, you know, see, see the light in that. Yeah, um, definitely. I did see a lot of wisdom, um, especially with her being, she's, she has a lot of faith, <laughs> by the way, a whole lot of faith. Uh, yeah. Um, um, and it's just so many things that she taught me along the way, but I've always been, I've, um, raised in church from since I was a kid when before my parents passed away and then when I got into the foster care system that part of me being in church um, and going to church and just reading my bible and all of that stuff that got taken away from me up until I came to her home and that's when I started um, going back to church I started serving um, in children's ministry with my son <laughs> so it was she, she she kept me faith grounded all throughout the years yes all throughout the years great and why is it that you foster? What is the main reason or why, what is it that called you to be a foster parent? Um, I feel like the Lord puts it in our hearts. He, you know, one of the things that he says is to look out for the widows and their children, you know, and when God gives you that open space in your heart, you just want to figure out how to fill it. 
you know? So some people go and they fill it with a car or they go fill it out with a house or a job. And then, but you really have to like be clear, what does God want you to do? And God will really hear, talk to you. He speaks to us through prayer, through Bible verses. And I kept on hearing foster 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 and so i started praying because i was a single mom myself <laughs> i was like oh my gosh <laughs> before i go yeah before i go tell everybody else because they're gonna be like you're nuts yeah. 26 years old trying to end with two kids and trying to take in two more <laughs> yeah so but the lord had already told me and once the lord tell you to do something you know that he's with you no matter what valley you're in no matter what mountain no matter what comes against you, you know that that's what the Lord. So the Lord had put it in my heart. And so whatever had to happen was going to happen. And whoever was going to tell me no, I wasn't going to listen to them. Because at the end of the day, it's me and the Lord I have to answer to. Thank you, ladies, so much. You are both very inspirational. And your story about getting your master's, your bachelor's, I commend you 100%. Because of you too, like you ladies are truly outstanding. Thank you. This is Janelle Baez with OVM TV, and we are at his house with David, David Gastillon, the development director for the site. How are you, David? I'm good, Janelle. Thank you so much. I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. So we are here today because uh, one of the cottages is being transformed, and they're welcoming in a brand new group of children. This is an organization that focuses on foster children from all over the world, an international program. And they welcome kids from all over the world to give them a safe place and give them hope for the future because these children come from places that never even had anything, lived on the floor, had no parents, no proper nutrition, and they come and make this place their future. So tell us a little bit about what your position entails, what it is that you oversee, um, what do you, what does a regular day look like for you here? So um, as a development director, we um, have a team, small team, uh, and our role really is to bring together the community um, to showcase the need of our children so that they can actually um, participate. So we work with our volunteer team, volunteer teams. Uh, we do the fundraising for the organization. Um, we are the ones that are in the community just letting folks know that there is a dire need for children that are here in South Florida um, and that these are the most at risk, um, at the highest risk uh, for being, continuing to be either abandoned, abused or neglected. Uh, so the children that live here at his house um, and call his house home are children that have been abandoned, abused or neglected, um, are in the foster care system in the state of Florida uh, or are unaccompanied minors that come from all over the world. How many children do you guys take care of here and do you welcome, welcome in um, on an average, on a yearly basis? Um, on a yearly basis, we see over 1,000 children. That's incredible. Um, yes, that they come, they can be here for uh, as, as low as maybe 30 days uh, to some, a couple of years, um, especially for those children that are um, teens that are in foster care. Unfortunately, many, th there's not enough foster families uh, to take in children. Um, there is a lot of stereotypes about children in foster care, um, but they are good kids. They just need an opportunity for someone to say, I'm going to give you a chance um, and to show them like an incredible sense of love and care that is that is persevering. Um, okay. So it's, it's important. So we see a little over a thousand children a year and on average daily, we have about 200 kids that live on campus here. Wow. Those children that um, are here for a certain amount of time, what happens after they leave here? Do are, are they discharged from here or do they decide themselves that they want to leave? So at 18 years old, uh, they become adults uh, legally. And so at 18 years old, they have to leave here. Okay. Um, so his house has a phenomenal um, in, uh, um, independent living program. Uh, and what we do in that program is to help kids understand things like financial literacy, health and wellness, um, workforce development, career orientation, so that they can be ready so when they turn 18 years old that they know where they're going. Um, something even more basic, Janelle, is that many children that come to his house, they don't have the very basic, basic things that identify you and I as human beings, in the United States at least, which is, which is uh, a birth certificate and a social security card. 
Imagine if without that in the United States, you you, you don't, don't you don't really you don't really exist if you will. Um, uh, but there's no no identity, and so our team here at this house, we work diligently to find that information for the kids, so when they leave here, they are able to have a you know they're going to be able to have a driver's license or at the very least an identification, um, the, all the paperwork that they need, so that they, they to make sure that they don't become homeless when they leave. Unfortunately, the statistics are that. If we're not around to be able to do what we do, within six months of children aging out of foster care at 18 years old, they will either become um, homeless or commit some kind of crime. So we are actually ahead of the gate ball by making sure that they don't become homeless, by giving them a chance to survive and thrive in our community when they turn adults. Yeah, that was my next question. What was the statistic or the ratio of those cases actually being successful once they're discharged from here? Yeah, so we have some amazing stories of uh, kids. So many children in foster care, they don't graduate high school. Uh, the, the, the average is under 50% of kids that are in foster care do not graduate high school. But the children here, they do attend some kind they of They do. School. All of the kids here attend school. They go to um, regular Miami-Dade County public schools um, because they are high risk. And when I say high risk, meaning that uh, they're vulnerable, and we know that in our, in our community, as in any community, uh, there are people that prey on the weak. Yes. And so we need to make sure that we protect them and we keep them safe at all times. So instead of them going on public transportation um, where they might be more exposed, we ourselves drive them to school, pick them up from school, and bring them back. That is excellent. Um, so we are, safety is our number one priority here in this house um, to ensure that they're, that they're, that they're, you know, that they're on the right path. Let's talk about Intermix. Intermix is, well, give me a little bit of background about Intermix. They're the ones that are sponsoring yes. this, um, and they do that with all the other homes as well. So they they are one of our they're one of our larger sponsors. Um, they um, Bob is amazing. He um, often maybe at least two or three times a year um, comes and they do these major cottage makeovers, what we call a major cottage makeover. And uh, and it helps us through all of all other needs that we have. So they've been a donor of ours for years. And um, he's been very faithful to uh, the ministry and to the mission of his house. And so we're, we're hoping that other people can follow suit um, and be change makers yes. for uh, for our children because we they need them. Yes. Um, they they need we need uh, people like um, like Intermix um, companies that can volunteer their time and their effort uh, and their talent to be able to come in and do these amazing projects. Yeah, no, because contributing <clears throat> contributing to this is uh, beneficial for our communities because we always say that children are our future. And imagine these children not being able to receive everything that you guys do for them and then going out into the community and then in the future these are the same children that are going to be committing murders yeah. you know ca causing chaos um just out in the world and that's what we want to live in on top of that we're doing the lord's work so you know it's our calling and you know however somebody perceives their spirituality but at the end of the day you know you're doing something that's good for the commonwealth and the common good of the world um some of these children that you guys house and you know you take care of here, um, are any of them ever combative? Do do they ever cause a lot of conflict? Or for the most part, are they getting used to kind of like a peaceful, regular day life? That's a great question, Janelle. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, I think it's so important for people to understand what does a child in 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 uh, in, in, um, in foster care what are they like? I'll be honest. Many of the children uh, that we receive here in his house um, are the children that no one wants. These are the children that have been up to fit, have had experience up to 50 different placements. What does that mean? Think about how you and I, um, or anyone that might be watching this, um, deals with rejection. Maybe uh, rejection of, of, of a marriage gone wrong or losing a significant other. Um, the death of someone, anything, how we deal with rejection and we deal with loss. When a child is in a home, in a foster home, or being removed from the first place from that home, um, that is a loss for them. That's a, a form of rejection. And if they go into another foster home, then they're, they're, they're told, well, I don't want you here, you have to leave. 
many of our children have had 50 experiences like that. They're, they're, they're being told, you're not wanted here, you have to leave. That adds more and more and more trauma to them. Yeah, it's like they don't know how to manage those emotions because it, it's just, it's overwhelming, especially at such a young age. Correct. And imagine if we as adults have a difficulty with that, when that happens to us in our own life, imagine children that have gone over and over with that. So how does that look? Of course, they're going to have behavioral issues. The trauma, many of the children, when they act out in anger, is because they're afraid inside. And um, and so there's a lot of anger. There's, there's, they don't know how to communicate um, what they're feeling. And that's why the mental health um, component of what we do here at His House is so important. And now in the month of May, that, we're, that we are acknowledging Mental Health Awareness Month, is so important for, for folks to understand that you know the kids are good. They've just been wounded, not broken. They've been wounded, um, and they just need help. But that hope comes with just giving them opportunities to let them know that, look, you know, you're not a product of your circumstances. This has happened, but this is just a moment in your life that you can grow from this and now be able to surpass it. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be able to help someone else that's going through that. And and that's, you know, as 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 people of faith is what we're supposed to do is to yes. help one another yes. um, and reach out across the, the, the aisle and say, hey, I'm here to help. Even if it's something as small as smiling at someone mm -hmm. uh, or listening or saying, you know, uh, I, I care for you. Um, I don't think that we do that enough in our society, in our community. Um, and people need to hear that because yes. we know that, you know, suicide in children is very high uh, and adults as well, mm -hmm. you know, but if you don't know if by smiling at someone and, and saying hello and acknowledging them, there would be a difference between them being here today and, and maybe not tomorrow. Yes. Well, because intention has a lot of power behind it. So, um, and children, because they're so pure, they actually can feel people's intention a lot more. Yes. So they know when somebody's being genuine or not. And I think that these children primarily are most helped when they have people that they feel truly care mm -hmm. and are willing to listen to them and actually provide solutions for them. Um, Mental health is so important. I mean, it's one of the most important things. And I always say, like, why don't we ever have something created as emotional health? Because they're two different aspects, you know, they're two different things. I mean, the mind controls the emotions. But I think that when you turn it around and you say emotional health, that brings children's guard down a little more because now you're not you're not kind of discounting their emotional health. That's right. Um, so this has been an incredible um, sitting with you. I loved everything that we saw over there. I mean, this is the first time I'm even here or that I even know about his house. I think a lot more people need to know about this. I think a lot more people should get more involved, more organizations should get involved. For those people that do care about these types of organizations and these causes, how would you suggest that they volunteer or, um, you know, any jobs or want to be a part of this cause as well? Yeah, so the first thing definitely is to uh, visit our website at hhch.org. Um, that would be very helpful. There's a lot of information that's on there um, in regards to how to volunteer, what our needs are, how to get involved. Um, in addition to May being um, uh, Child uh, a, a Mental Health Awareness Month, it's also Foster Parent Appreciation Month. Um, so we do, I think, you know, we do try to do God's work here as much as we can, but children really need to be in someone's home. They need normalcy, they need stability. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more about that, in um, we're gonna be having a foster parent information session here on campus um, so that folks that are interested in that uh, would be, uh, we, we're going to, to tour the, the uh, organization um, and just share a little bit about what I've shared with you today about what it's like to be in, um, uh, to, to take care for kids in foster care, uh, but they can do that. They can learn a little bit about what, it like, what it's like to be a foster parent. If they can't do that, then maybe um, they can help in, uh, through donations because many of our children have never uh, gone to a movie theater. They've never gone to a restaurant before. Wow. Um, so if someone donates you know, funding to help us get there, that would be fantastic. And it's all the funding goes there. What you see here, is through the faithful giving of people, yes. you know, through cottage makeovers. Um, and the great thing about his house is that you donate and you know where your money's going. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage anyone that is listening or, or watching that they can please maybe come um, to uh, to help us uh, with our kids. 
And and if you can't for whatever reasons, at the very least, pray for them and yes. pray for us. Yeah, stop pressing. Definitely. Your community outreach and your marketing, is it also expanded through social media? Yes. So okay. our handle is His House Miami uh, through Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have a YouTube channel. Many are, are there are very emotional, powerful stories uh, from our foster parents to um, incredible stories of success and overcoming incredible odds um, that the children have been able to do so. There's a lot of information that you can learn about that, um, about those stories, and just really kind of in, in, in dive into what it is um, for children to be in foster care and what the good work of what we do here in this house is, is happening in our community. Thank you, David. You're welcome, Janelle. Thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome.